Hey there, in this video we're talking about processing arrays and passing arrays into functions in C++ programming. And this more or less covers sections 7.4 to 7.5 in the Gaddis textbook. So in the prior video we had our introduction to arrays, where we're making arrays for the first time. We saw it's very easy, just one line of code, to make a big block of memory with as many variables as you need in a larger program. And now we're going to see, in this video, we're going to see a lot of common tasks and you're probably going to need to do at least one or two of these anytime you've got an array in your system at all. So these are some very important techniques that you really want in your toolbox when you are dealing with arrays. Let's talk about that. So let's say you have a big array of numbers. Uh, almost all the time, you're going to want to compute some statistics based on that array. For example, finding the sum, finding the total of everything in the array, that can be important. Finding the average is important, we do that a lot. Finding the minimum or the smallest number. Finding the maximum or the biggest number, right? These are all very important things that you're going to want some of these almost any time you've got an array of numbers. So that's what we're about to see on the next couple of slides. Some techniques, there's nothing magic about it, just some techniques that we should all know about. And, you know, don't forget chapter six. Remember that we want our programs to be modular. We don't want a big long main function. We want little slices of functions that do one specific job. So if I was gonna do one of these jobs, I would want that specific task in one well-defined function of maybe like around seven lines at most. So I might have one function that just computes the sum of an array. And I'd have a different function that just computes the minimum of the array or the maximum. And so we definitely want that in all of our programs all the time. No exceptions to that. So we'll see all of these things in this video here today. Okay, talk about that first one, finding the sum of an array. Here's a little slice of code that would do that. Let's say I have an array called units and the size of that array is num units. This code here will compute the total, adding everything up in the array. And that should look familiar because all we're doing is we're just using an accumulator just like we saw back in chapter five to add together all the array elements. So you just think back to that. You need a variable for the accumulator. Here it's called total. Start it off at zero, just like a cash register would start at. You have a for loop to process the array. That's always gonna be the case. That's how you process arrays with a for loop. From zero to just less than the number of units, the size of this array. And every step through, you take the next item in the array and just add it into total. So you add in units sub zero and then units sub one and then units sub two and you add all of them in. And once this loop is done, total is holding the result of adding everything in the array like that. Now, okay, let's say you want, so that hopefully that's pretty obvious and you can get familiar with that. Um, so let's say you want the average of an array. Okay, well, hopefully you know the average, of course, is the result when you add up all the numbers and divide by how many there are. So for the average, all you have to do is do this, get the total first, and then divide by the size of the array. Like in this case, you divide by num units. So do total, divide by num units, and that will actually give you the average of the array. And then you can do whatever you want with those things, of course. You can, you can print it out, you can use it in some more math, you can return it from your function is really probably what you ought to expect to do. Right? I would have this in one dedicated function just to find the sum of an array and then return the result, return total or average if that's what you need. Okay, so if that's pretty familiar, basically use an accumulator from chapter five. And that's what that would look like. Okay, just a couple lines of code, it's not hard. Now, the new thing here will be finding the minimum or maybe the maximum of an array. And this slice of code here would find the smallest thing in your numerical array. Uh, let's think about that. You know, it looks a little bit, actually, just a tiny little bit. It echoes what the accumulator looks like for finding the total. So what's happening here is we're making a variable called lowest to hold the smallest thing that we've seen in the array so far. We're going to scan everything in the array from, from, from start to end. And lowest is holding the smallest thing we've seen so far. So that gets initialized not to zero, but to the value of the first element of the array, which is numbers subscript zero. So in this example, I've got an array called numbers, and presumably here's the constant for how big it is, that's the size of the array. 
initialize lowest to the very first thing in the array. Okay, just look at the very first thing and say, well, this is the smallest thing I've seen so far and record that in this variable. Now we're gonna scan every element of the array. Uh, we've already looked at array subscript zero. We don't have to look at it again. So this for loop here is starting at one, which is really the second thing, starting at one and again, uh, going as long as your count is less than size. And what you're gonna do in this loop is you're gonna look at the next item in the array numbers sub count. So it'll be number sub one and number sub two and later number sub three, but whatever it is, you take that number and you see is, you check, is this less than what I've got recorded in the lowest variable? Okay, what I'm looking at, is it less than what I've seen before? If so, apparently this here is the smallest thing you've seen so far. So we'll take this number sub count and we'll record it in the lowest variable because now that's the smallest thing we've seen so far. And you go check the next one, and you go check the next one, and you go to check the next one. And every time you find an element that's even smaller than anything you've seen before, you record that in this lowest variable. And then after the loop, once the loop is done, that lowest variable will be holding the minimum element. And it just takes four lines of code to make that happen. Very common task. You should definitely study this and be able to recreate this if you need to. And, you know, for my programming courses, something like this happens on almost every single assignment for the rest of the year, frankly. Now, let's think about what would need to change here if you wanted the code to find the biggest thing in the array, the maximum. You know, very, very simple. Actually, all you need to do is just change this relation on line 27, right? This lesser than sign is doing a search for things that are small. But if you just flip that right there to a greater than sign, now the loop is searching for things that are big. And the result at the end is actually gonna be the biggest thing. Um, I guess I'd also rename the variable, right? So instead of lowest, I would call this variable highest because as usual, you want your variable names to say what they do and do what they say. So if it's gonna hold the highest, call it highest. But other than that, it works exactly the same way. Variable, initialize the first thing, for loop to scan the whole thing, see if what you're looking at is bigger. If so, record that. Almost the exact same code to find the minimum or the maximum. So you should be familiar with that. We usually wanna do something like that, but we should, uh, you know, we should run this in the IDE and the debugger and make sure we totally understand exactly what's happening with that algorithm. Okay, so here is the example code for the finding the minimum of an array algorithm out of the book. And they kind of have it in separate parts and I've spliced it together in one program here. So um, you can see here making an array size six in this case, standard input loop, getting data from the user for all six things. And then down here is the finding the minimum algorithm. Uh, let me, you know, what I'll do is I'll run this once full speed. So I'll compile this and I'll run it once full speed. Just confirm that it works. So enter six numbers. How about 30, 50, 20, 60, 10, and 40. Okay, and it says the lowest is 10. And of course that's correct. Of these numbers, the lowest number is actually 10. Um, so now let's actually uh, step through it one line at a time and see what's happening there. Uh, the input part, we've seen that a bunch of times before. I don't need to step through that. I will put a breakpoint on the interesting thing, which is the beginning of this find the lowest algorithm. And um, let me start debugging this. Put this over here. Again, I'm just running the input part at full speed. So 30, 50, 20, 60, 10, and 40. Okay, and now the program has paused down here. So I'll put a watch on that array numbers. And you can see at this point, all the data that I entered as the user is sitting there in the array, right there. Um, and uh, now I will put a watch on this lowest variable, which seems important. And also there's this count here that's gonna get used to control the for loop. So we'll inspect that. Now, currently uh, we're sitting on line 25 and we've, we haven't run that line yet. So as usual, these variables have random garbage in them as the program starts up. You know, count hasn't even been declared yet. It doesn't exist until you get inside the for loop on line 26. That actually doesn't exist yet. But uh, 
It's about to. So we're going to initialize lowest to the very first thing in the array. Number sub zero is this 30. So you're going to see that go into lowest. Okay, so lowest currently has 30. We've only scanned the very first thing, and the smallest thing we've seen so far is that 30. So that's what's being recorded. Now, count had just got declared, and it's going to get initialized to 1. Okay, so count is 1. We're in the body of the for loop, and we're going to look at numbers sub 1. But the ID is kind of helping me out here. Numbers sub 1 is actually this 50. Right, That's the subscript number 1 of the array. So it's going to look at 50 and say, is 50 less than lowest, which is currently 30? See right here, is 50 less than low, less than 30? Uh, well, obviously false. So in this case, we're going to skip over line 28. We're done with that iteration, and we're going to go back to the loop controller on line 26. Great. So now count will get incremented, and count will turn into 2. There it is, count is 2. And so now it's going to look at number sub 2. Now number sub 2 is this 20 here, and it's going to do the comparison is 20 less than lowest, which is currently 30. Is 20 less than lowest? Is 20 less than 30? Well, obviously that's true. So in this case, we are going to run line 28. Okay, here we are going to line 28 here. And you take that thing that you're currently looking at, the 20, which is in number sub 2, take the 20 and store it in lowest. That's the way that we keep record of the smallest thing we've seen so far. So look at lowest, and it just became 20. All right, and then you go on from there. So count will become three. Now you're looking at number sub three, which is this 60. Is 60 less than 20? Well, that's false. So we'll skip over line 28. We're coming back here. Count's gonna become four. Now we're gonna look at number sub four, zero, one, two, three, four. Well, that's the 10. Is 10 less than 20? Well, that's true, obviously. So we are gonna run line 28. Here comes line 28. We're going to take that 10, which is in number sub 4, and store it in lowest. So here's lowest, and you're going to see that turn into 10 right now. There it is. Now we've got the 10 in there. Back to this line. Count is going to become 5. All right. So now we're checking in on number sub 5, and number sub 5 is this 40. So is 40 less than 10? Well, that's false. So we'll skip over line 28, go back to the loop controller, and what's going to happen next is count's going to become 6. All right, you're going to check the update here. Is 6 less than 6? Well, that's false. That's what gets you out of this for loop. You jump down to line 30. And here we are after the loop, and you notice that lowest actually does have a 10 in it. And that's what gets printed out over here on the console. Yeah, the lowest is 10. That's what we saw. So again, when you run at full speed, right, when you run at a full 4 billion operations per second, it just looks like the 10 just appears. But there's quite a bit of work happening under the hood. Lowest actually started out at 30, then it became 20, and then it became 10 as it scanned the array and found sequentially smaller things over time. So quite a bit of work happening very quickly when the programs normally run. Uh, but I like doing this in the debugger one step at a time at least once to get a real true understanding of what's happening with our find the minimum algorithm. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, now a little bit of a tangent here. The thing that I don't like about the programs we've been dealing with recently is the fact that we have this fixed array size. Like I have a program that handles six employees and the users got to enter six numbers, no more, no less. They don't have any choice about it, right? And the programs are very uh, brittle in the sense that it's not giving a lot of flexibility to the user. Maybe the user has, has fewer employees. Maybe they have more. Why can't our programs handle that? So this slide right here has a solution to that to give some flexibility for handling more or less data. It's called a partially filled array. So sometimes an array only needs to store some subset of its total size. Uh, for example, if the needed size of the user is not known when you're writing the program, when the program starts up, here's what we're gonna do. Just make an array and just give it a ridiculously large size. Like make an array size 100 or 500 or something really big. Uh, something you know that user isn't gonna, isn't, is not actually gonna need that many things, is more than they really need. 
And then as the user enters data and you store it in the array, you're gonna be using a counter variable to keep track of how many pieces of data the user entered. And then later on, you can use that counter variable for your processing as, find, as far as finding the sum or the total, the average or the minimum, the maximum or printing it or whatever, right? So you're gonna have this new separate variable for how many things the user entered into the array. Notice that that's different from the constant for the total size of the array. So I might have an array size 100, that would be my constant, but maybe the user only typed in 30 things. So I'd have to have a variable holding the 30 as far as how much data is actually entered. So this is why we call it a partially filled array. You have a really big array, but you're only using part of it. You're only using the part the user needs. And once you do that, the user can enter five things or six things or 30 things or 80 things, right? And that gives a lot more flexibility to the user for however much data they need. Here's an example of that. And the book has little slices of this and I kind of put it together for a program. So here's an example of a partially filled array. And like we said here, uh, lines 9, 10, we're declaring a big array. I don't know how much data the, the user needs, so I'm just declaring an in integer array of size 100, actually. Now here is this counter variable, like we said, that's gonna keep track of how much data the user actually entered. I do not know with this program, I do not know how much data the user has to enter. So here's the input part of this program, and you can see here that we're not using a for loop, a for loops account controlled loop, that's when you know how much stuff is happening to begin with. And in this program, I don't know, the user could have more stuff or less stuff. So here we're gonna use a sentinel controlled loop, like we started talking about back in chapter five, a sentinel controlled loop. Um, and we're gonna ask the user to enter some number or negative one to quit. So you're gonna enter a number, enter another number, enter as many numbers as they want. And then once they hit negative one, that tells our program that they're done with that. So you have this uh, integer called number here to receive their input, right? Prompt the user like that, send in a number. And then here for a sentinel controlled loop, right? You don't use four, you use a while loop. So hopefully you remember this back from chapter five or, or other places. So we're gonna keep going in this loop while the number that the user entered is not equal to negative one. That makes sense. And, oh, other thing to be careful about, is we need to make sure that the count is less than the size. Remember, if the count goes up over 100, that's not legitimate and we'll actually have a problem. So we need to make sure that the user doesn't type in any more than 100 things. So checking in on both of those things. So assuming that's the case, look really carefully at line 18 because there's some interesting stuff happening. At least two things are happening there. So first thing is whatever the user typed in for the number is going to get assigned into array sub count, which is gonna start off at zero the first time. Okay, so the very first number they put in gets saved in array sub zero, which is of course the start of the array. And then second thing is happening there, you see there's that plus plus increment. And if you remember back from chapter five, I think, um, that's being written in post fixed notation after the variable, which tells us that's gonna be the very last thing on the line that happens. So after the assignment happens, count's gonna get incremented up to one, which is the correct thing to do because it's recording how much data has been put in. At this point, you've got one thing in the array. And then you prompt the user to enter another number. You send in a number. You come back to the while statement and assuming they did not enter negative one, you come down here and now on line 18, you're gonna store that number in array sub one because that's what count will be. And then after that happens, then count gets incremented up to two. And you go on like that. So every time you, you add another piece of data into the array on line 18, count then gets incremented to keep track of how many things you added. And that's how that works there. Okay, so at, at some point, the user is gonna enter that sentinel of negative one. And at that point, when you're up on line 17, you'll check is number not equal to negative one? Well, that'll be false, because the number actually will be negative one and that gets you out of the while loop down on line 24. And now in this particular example, we're just gonna print all that data back out. So now you do know how much data was entered by the user because of that count variable. Now you can use a for loop and right here, the limit of that for loop on line 25 is count. 
and you're just gonna print out however many things the user entered. Not the whole array, just the data the user actually entered. So that's what that looks like. And of course, you know, you've got this index here for the loop, uh, the loop iterator, and you just print out array sub zero, array sub one, array sub two, however many things the user entered. Okay, so here is our example of using a partially filled array. And um, again, it's in a couple of different parts of the book and I've spliced it together so we can actually test this. Let me compile this, great. And when I have a program, you know, I tend to like to test it at least three times, if not more than that. Let me do that right now. I'm gonna run this full speed, so to speak. Um, so the user has some data, they get to enter it here. Maybe they have uh, 10 and 20, 50, 100, 200, that's it. So I'll type in negative one. And it looks like this program is successfully recording those five numbers and then processing it and printing it out later on. So that's what's happening there. But let's say the user has less data. Like maybe they just have three things. Uh, so they enter 10, 20, 50, and negative one to quit. And that works. So it looks like this program is happy to record three pieces of data and print it out later on. But what if the user had more data? So here I've got a user with a whole bunch of stuff. And more than that, maybe all the way up to 10,000 here. That's the end. So that also works, okay? So if I have a whole bunch of data, this program also records that and prints that stuff out. So this is what we really want a partially filled array for, is giving the user this flexibility so they might have more or less. You know, as a professor, I'm teaching classes, I need to record grades. And sometimes I have 30 students and sometimes I have 15 or 12, and I've had more than that and I've had less than that. So I certainly need a program that's gonna handle more or less data, however many students I have for the grades, it's just one example. And that's really what you want from a program. So that's what we needed the partially filled array to handle. Um, yeah, so I like how that works. And the thing I really wanna do here is step through this in the debugger one line at a time, and we can see what's actually happening in memory with our partially filled array. So here's a break point, and I'll start debugging. Uh, and I'll put some watches on the important variables, of course, starting with the array. Now, as this shows up in the debug tab over here, hopefully you can tell me what's in the array. It's got 100 elements. It's very big. Hopefully you can tell me what's the, what the contents of the array are as this program starts up. And we've seen that a bunch of times, so no big surprise. It's a bunch of random garbage. So a 100 element array goes on and on and on. It doesn't even fit on screen right now. And it's got some small numbers, it's got some big numbers. I'm sure down the line it's got some zeros and negatives. But right this second, um, of course, if I'd had an initialization list on line 10, it would have been a different story. But um, as usual, program starts up, you have uninitialized data. Right now I've got 100 elements of random garbage. Uh, also, there's this count variable that's supposed to keep track of how many things the users entered so far. And there's this number variable that receives each piece of input from a sin statement. And all that stuff's all random garbage to begin with. But let's see how the program actually uses that stuff. Uh, I'm gonna get to line 11 here. Sets count to zero, that's good. Of course, if that's tracking how many things the user's entered, user hasn't, has not entered anything right now, so that's correct. And now we're in the user input part of the program. And you get this prompt here. Uh, right, and then you're gonna get this sin statement on line 16, so I'll run that. I'll enter some kind of data. This 10 is gonna get stored in that number variable over there. Great, and then we get into the while loop. Just think about that for a second, right? We get to line 17 and it checked in on is 10 not equal to negative one? Well, that's obviously true. And it's also careful to make sure that count is less than size. That's super easy, because right this second, zero, that's count, and size is 100, so obviously that's true. And that's what got us into the body of the while loop. Now we're on this critical line 18, and two things are about to happen. It's gonna take number, which is 10, and put it in array sub zero. Of course, array sub zero is the very first thing in the array, so where that eight currently is, that's gonna get overwritten with a 10, 
And then the second thing that happens is that count gets incremented up to one. So let's see that, All right? So you can see where the 10 went and count got incremented one. That's actually two things happening on one line with 18 with the post fix increment notation. And now you're gonna do it again. So here comes another prompt. Here comes another sin statement and I'll type in another number that's gonna go into number obviously. And the while statement is still true. So you get down to here. So now number that 20 is gonna get copied into array sub one, which is the second thing in array. So where that 13110416 random garbage is, we're gonna copy 20 in over there. There it is. And of course, the second thing happened is that count got incremented up to two. Okay, so uh, do this again. So there's a prompt, here's a sin statement. I'll type in 50 for the number. There we go. The while statement's still true. So we're gonna store that in array sub two, which is where the 13107200 is right there. So there goes the 50 into the array, count just got incremented to three, keeping track that I actually have entered three things. And here's another prompt. I'm gonna call this good enough on this example, right? I'll enter the negative one, which is gonna get me out of the while loop right there. I have to enter, of course. There we go. So got out of the while loop right there. And here's the thing I wanna emphasize. This is actually why I'm doing this right here. As you look at the array, right? I've entered three valid pieces of data, the 10 and the 20 and the 50 are the data that I actually want. The rest of the array is still there full of random garbage. Okay, so just the beginning, just the start of the array has valid data in it and I still have 97 elements of random garbage sitting in that array. And that's why it's really important that we have this count variable sitting around to remind us to keep track of how much actual valid data is in the array as opposed to all the remaining random garbage. So now when we start printing this stuff out with the for loop, we're not gonna go zero up to 100, we're just gonna go zero up to three because that's the valid stuff. So I should make a watch for this index here actually. Okay. So um, here index is getting initialized to zero and we're gonna print out array sub zero, which is the 10. And that gets on the screen. And now index gets incremented up to one and we're gonna print out array sub one, which is the 20. There we go. Index becomes two. Print out array sub two, that's the 50. There we go. And now when index becomes three, it checks in on is three, less than the three for the count, that's false, and that is what gets you out of the for loop. So, um, so that's what we mean by a partially filled array. That's how we provide the user flexibility on whether they want more stuff or less stuff. You still have this really big array hanging around, right? I could have entered 100 things if I'd wanted to, but in this case, I'm just using the start of the array, which is what we mean by being partially filled and I still have 97 elements of random garbage that I definitely did not want to see on screen right there. And that's what a partially filled array does. And uh, that's why you want it to provide flexibility to the user if they have more data or less data. So that's an important technique. I'm glad we saw that. All right, now uh, back to the main topic. Um, uh, we said at the outset that uh, we need to remember that we always want our programs to be modular split up into a bunch of separate functions. Our functions should be well-defined, easy to understand, just do one single job. So uh, again, functions by default cannot access data in other functions. That's a different scope. The only data that the function can access is whatever you pass in to the parameters. So if a function needs the data from an array to compute the sum or the average or the minimum or the maximum, then you've got to pass the array in as a parameter so that it has access to it. And here's what that's gonna look like. Your function prototype is gonna look like this. Your function call is gonna look like this. And let's think about what's happening there. So arrays can be passed into functions as arguments. And the main thing that you're gonna to need to study and remember is that in C++, to pass an array into a function, you need two parameters, two parameters, right, in both the prototype and the function call. And so, um, as usual, your function is going to have return type, you know, maybe void or something, 
if you're computing an average or a minimum or maximum, that's gonna that's gonna be either int or double or something like that. Give it a good name, of course, like compute average would be a good name. And then in the prototypes, of course, you only need to indicate the types of the things. So if I have an integer array that I wanna pass in, I'd write down int and then empty square brackets. You don't need any number in there. All you need to do is tell the compiler square brackets, say this here, that's an array. That's all you need. It's gonna figure out the rest of it uh, on its own. But what you do need to do here, the second parameter, that's how you indicate the size. You need a separate second parameter, which has to be an integer because arrays are always integer size. That's where you put the size, not in the square brackets. Um, and then when you actually call it, again, two parameters, right? Make sure you study that, make sure you remember that. That's gonna be very natural. So when you call it, you don't need to put down the types because the compiler is already gonna know what the types of all these things are from the prototype. That's why the prototype's there. So don't write down any types, just name the function. Here come parentheses, name the array, no square brackets at all. It already knows that it's an array from the prototype. So you don't need any square brackets at all there, just name of the array. And the second parameter is gonna be the size of the array. And there's your two parameters. So let's think about why that makes sense. The, remember we said in the last video, we said the array name is actually holding the address of where the array starts in memory. You're actually just passing in the address. Hey function, here's where this array starts. Here's the very first byte where the array starts. And the other thing that you need to know, of course, is the function needs to know, well, where does the array end? And that's what this size parameter is telling it. So really what you're doing is you're telling the function, here's where the array starts. And then over here, here's where the array is gonna end. And if you kind of keep that in mind, that makes a lot of sense that that's the information the function needs. Here's where it starts and here's where it ends. So clearly two parameters like that. Now, admittedly, not all programming languages work like this. C works like this, C++ works like this. Java, you only need just the one array element for the argument because Java can track the size automatically. But here in C++, the programmer is in charge and you, the programmer, do need to specify both of these things. Now, the other detail there is if the name of the array is really the address of where it starts, and that's what you're really passing in when you do that. Well, if you think back to our discussion with functions passing by reference, that's exactly what we said about passing values by reference. We said we're really passing the address of where the data is in the memory system. So that's what we're doing here because array names actually are addresses and therefore this works exactly like you're passing the array by reference. Okay, so that's what it says here. Note arrays effectively are always passed by reference because they're an address and that's what pass by reference actually does, passes in an address. So if you think about the, the um, side effects of that, uh, that's a good thing because when you pass by reference, you're not making a copy you're just telling the function where the data is. And that makes a lot of sense for arrays because they're probably really big. And if you're doing the normal pass by value, making a big copy, you're really wasting time on the CPU, chewing up cycles. You're really wasting memory when you don't need to you know, make a duplicate of this big thing. Why do that? So passing in this way with the address by reference saves a lot of time, saves a lot of space. But the disadvantage is that there's a little bit of danger is the function could change the data in the array. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you want that for an input function. Maybe that's a bad thing if you didn't want that and the programmer working in that slice of code gets confused or something like that. So um, kind of high reward of not doing the copy, but also kind of high risk because the function could possibly change the contents of the array when you don't want to. So kind of keep that in mind. Passing arrays into functions are effectively always passed by reference because they're really just an address. Here's where the array starts and the size tells it, here's where the array ends. And that's what you always do. Again, pass in two parameters. You wanna pass an array, you gotta pass in two parameters like that. So you probably wanna practice this and get in this habit with C++ programming because that's what it's gonna look like. Little side point, if you're using a partially filled array like we were talking about, then this size could be the count of the actual valid data. It does not have to be the whole size of the array, just could be the valid data part of a partially filled array. 
All right, so we're going to do this all the time, right? We need all of our programs to be modular, separated out all the time. So here's an example of that in the book, program 717. And you've got a prototype on line five for a function called show values. Clearly, that's an output function. It's going to print stuff to the screen. We make our output functions void, so that's not too surprising. And as we, as we said, you've got two parameters, right? Just indicating the types here in the prototype. So the type of the first parameter is integer array, right? Square brackets say array. You don't need anything in the brackets at all. That's just telling the compiler here, this first thing is going to be an integer array. And the second thing is going to be an integer. And obviously, that's the number for the size. Now, uh, here's the main function here. And we're using an initialization list to just get some data in this array size 8. So you've got an array called numbers, uh, size 8. And it's storing these numbers 5, 10, 15, up to 40. Here's the call to our printing function where we're passing this array into the show values function on line 12, right? Name the function show values. Here's our two parameters. First one is the name of the array numbers. There's no square brackets there. The compiler already knows that's an array because we told it up in the prototype right here. So just name the array, that's it, no square brackets. And the second thing is however big it is, which of course is being stored in this named constant array size. So there's your two things. Start of the array here, end of the array over here. And of course, here is the show values function down here implemented. So here we are giving names to the two parameters. The first parameter is called nums here. Again, that's type integer array. And the second parameter is called size, like we normally do. There's the integer for that. And if you just want to print that out, here's your standard for loop with a counter called index going from zero to less than size. And once again, you're just going to print everything out in that array, num sub zero, and num sub one and num sub two, however big it is. There's your standard thing. So you can run this on your own. Uh, this does compile, it does actually run and successfully passes in access to this array declared up in the main function. And now this function has access to it by passing it in, kind of like it's passed by reference actually. Right, if we didn't have those arguments, this function would not have access to stuff in other functions like that numbers array up on line 10. So you need this and this will be very, very common and this is all through the work we do all the time. So get really comfortable declaring arrays and passing them into functions with the two parameters like this. If you need to practice that, do that. One other thing. So we're about to get to a lab with my students. There's one other thing that pops up in the lab here called a type alias. So there's a keyword in C++ called type def. Looks like this. And what we're going to use that for is a type alias defines a new name for an existing data type. Type def is really short for type definition. You're defining a new type. You can define your own types in C++. So in addition to int, char, bool, float, double, string, you can define your own types, new. And you do that with this type def command, this type def keyword. So the idea here is if we start having some type that we're using a lot repetitively, and the name of it's long and complicated, we could do, use, use a type def and basically create a new name for the same thing that's clearer, more descriptive, easier for other programmers to read, and maybe just shorter. Um, here's an example of that. So if I write down in C++, if I write down type def int timesheet bracket seven, um, the old type that we're talking about is integer array size seven. Presumably, I'm writing a program where I'm about to write integer array size 7 a whole bunch of times. And it'll be a little bit cryptic and a little bit unclear. And the new name that I'm giving that is Timesheet. Capital T Timesheet, we make new types. We give it a capital letter to kind of indicate that. So presumably, this is a program that is storing people's hourly work hours for a week for each of the seven days through a week. So instead of writing integer array size 7 every time I need to do that, now I can just write Timesheet all by itself. And any place I write timesheet, that's just an alias for integer array size seven. And hopefully writing timesheet is again, shorter and clearer and a little bit more obvious when programmers need to read it. So that's gonna start showing up in examples and labs. And that's kind of uh, why I wanted this slide right here. All right, 
So that's a bunch of really useful, really important stuff that we all need to know about when we're dealing with arrays. Really, just all of this stuff in this video is totally critical. So my students and I would get together for this lab 7.1 here, working with one-dimensional arrays. And that might be a little bit of a hint about what comes next, actually. All the, array, the arrays we've seen so far are just one single block of memory. Uh, that's actually not the, the, the end of the story. Later on, we're going to expand on that. But for now, just one single array at a time. Uh, this program here should let the user enter a number of grades, store them in an array, and then compute the highest grade, compute the lowest grade, compute the average of the grades. And again, each of those tasks needs to be in a separate, well-defined function that just does one of those things. So this is actually one of the longer labs we ever do. And it actually does practice everything we talked about in the last two videos making an array, processing it with for loops, computing the sum and the average and the minimum and the maximum, having separate functions for all that stuff. Um, you know, I don't know how many uh, students the user has, so they might be entering less grades or more grades, uh, and therefore we're going to use a partially filled array in this lab. So everything we've talked about so far gets baked into this fairly large lab, and, and I think that's good to practice all that stuff because it's, it's all super important. So if you do have access to the lab code for the book, maybe you know, get that on your own and try that. I think it's a very good thing to practice at this point. So in the next video, a couple other things, uh, a little bit more sophisticated. We're going to look at issues of uh, you know, details of strings. What are strings? Well, they're just arrays, really. They're just arrays of characters, of course. If you need a bunch of stuff, you use an array. So we'll dig in a little bit more detail about what strings really are. They're really just arrays, as a matter of fact. Uh, get some perspective on that. Uh, the programs so far have only had one array at a time. You can have more. You can have two or three or four arrays. Those are called parallel arrays that we'll talk about. And we'll also talk about the single biggest danger in all of programming, the single biggest security risk, memory risk, the single biggest danger in all of programming uh, is uh, what happens if you misuse an array, actually. It's called a buffer overflow. And that is so incredibly important. I, I, I need everybody to know about that. All... C++ programmers need to know about this huge danger to avoid it called buffer overflow. So I really hope you tune in for that, and I'll see you then.